I believe the past does have an effect on the present. And then that also has an effect on the future. So what you bring from the past into the now, that will dictate your future. If you're always reflecting on the negative things, you're going to feel negative. Oh, I got to go. I've been working, told them, please don't hit my phone. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. Swear I paid all my fees. I was starving for this day. Now my fan they can't eat. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Cup of Nurses show with your hosts Peter and Matt, two nurses on a mission to change this world, one conversation at a time. So let's jump right into it. But before that. If you find a value in this show, I want to join us on this mission. Please share and review the show. It would mean absolutely everything to us. Cupofnurses.com for the latest info, updates, what we're up to, and all of our merch releases. If you want to check out our lifestyle podcast, check out wearefrontlinewarriors.com. In this episode, we would like to introduce you to Gary Clinton. Gary is a mental health enthusiast passionate about mental health, dreams, nutrition, fitness, and creating a ripple effect on this earth to change human consciousness. We talk about the philosophy of life and how Gary overcame depression to become the person he is today. Hey Gary, pleasure having you on the show. Can you give us the story about who you are? Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you, P, for being here too. Yeah, a bit of story about myself. My name's Gary. I'm a young male from Dublin, Ireland here. Um, in this beautiful country. Maybe I'll come over and visit one day, guys. But a bit about my story is that, um, and before I tell you about my story, actually, I want to give you two points. Maybe the listeners could get some value. You know, I do speak fast as well, by the way. A bit of an energy enthusiastic in there. And um, two things about my stories, or anyone's story, that I recommend is, there's a quote from Tom Robbins. And the quote is, it's never too late to have a good childhood. Now, I have my story, Matt, you of yours, Pete, you of yours, and the listeners have theirs. 100%. But are you reflecting on your story and are you looking at the negative, traumatic, horrific times? Or are you looking at, you know, the Christmases, the birthdays, the holidays, the time of your family that was really nice? So that's the quote by Tom Robbins. It's never too late to have a happy childhood. And the other thing is maybe for I know, practitioners or for anyone listening again is know your story. Right? If you're going to get on a podcast with Matt or Pete or anyone, they're going to ask you a question about what your story is. And if you don't know it, maybe practice it in the mirror with yourself. So my story, um, when I was 16, my dad committed suicide straight off the bat, jumping right in there at the end. And before that, I was getting bullied a lot in school. But hey, that's, that's okay. I think a lot of people do get bullied. When I was 16, my dad committed suicide. That obviously threw my life kind of upside down in, in many ways. But, you know, I was kind of all right because all I did was game all day. I would avoid everything. I'm masking the pain. And then two years later, I started drinking alcohol, which is a responsible thing here in Ireland because 18 is, is the legal age. I know a lot of my friends didn't start till they were, or they started when they were 13, 14, 15. And I don't know about you, you two boys if you still drink alcohol or if you did start before that. But I started drinking then at 18. And um, yeah, I started to mask more pain. I was drinking every weekend or drink maybe twice a week, three times a week. And then eventually I do that every week of every month and uh, eventually I was offered drugs. I took drugs and that was a snowball effect that became a, an addict. In fact, I was doing drugs every day of every week of every month and I really, really had my life. I started to go downhill a lot. I messed up my life. I was hanging around with bad people, not bad people, people that weren't, didn't have the best interest in me. I was hanging around, I, didn't, I was in debt to drug dealers. I was having arguments with my family. My life was Definitely a mess. I was so much of a drug addict. I was doing drugs and work. Okay, I really, really started to hate myself. I eventually hit rock bottom. And rock bottom is not good. But rock bottom is also a great place to build foundations on. Now, I don't recommend going down to rock bottom, but it is a nice place to start um, if, if you're there. And if you're currently near there, recovery is possible. And I could be an example of that, or there, there could be Millions of people have an example of that. So maybe I can hopefully inspire you with that story. Um, what I did to get help, got therapy from a therapist. Um, basically, 
one thing led to another where I came to some agreements with her and saying, I'm not going to drink drugs, I'm not going to do drugs anymore. Eventually that stopped and my life started getting better. Surprisingly, no, that's a joke, by the way, guys. Uh, I stopped doing uh, alcohol. Um, then I started meditating, exercising, getting better. And really it's been a snowball effect up towards into an amazing life. I became a best-selling author in the free section as well, guys. Okay, not the, the, There's not a passive income way as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, my life's been really amazing. My life is really amazing now, but even to this day, with the amazing relationships, amazing finances, amazing emotions, dreams that I've got in my life, I'm still just a shy, um, fearful, anxious guy in a heart. I think that it's a normal thing. So maybe you're feeling some fear inside of you guys, but you can make them dreams become a reality. I am somewhat living a dream from where I was a couple of years ago. And it's amazing to be on this podcast. And that's, that's my story up until now. So thank you for asking me, Matt. That's a very powerful story of what happened. And geez, I could just imagine the, the turbulences that you went through through, through your life. Mm-hmm. And I, before we get into the story, I want to kind of reflect back to the point where you said that it's never too late to heal childhood. So that almost sounds like that time is not linear. It, the past is always existing with us. And it seems like the past was almost haunting you where you went to the to the lower depths where you hit rock bottom, where you're resorting to different things, video games, essentially numbing yourself. So if there was something you learned from the story, do you think it was not putting maybe enough love for yourself or was it not accepting the things that you experienced as a child, as a teenager that really led you to the, the path that you went on before you hit rock bottom? It's beautiful. Really, what stuck out to me there when you were talking is that loving for yourself. I definitely did not love myself in any way, shape, or form. And I don't think I accepted what went on in my life. I would absolutely agree with you that I didn't love myself. And also, time isn't linear. I believe the past does have an effect on the present. And then that also has an effect on the future. So what you bring from the past into the now that will dictate your future. If you're always reflecting on the negative things, you're going to feel negative. So you need to focus on what was good in your life, and then you'll reflect them. Uh, you know, you can't drive your car looking in the rearview mirror. Okay, you're going to crash your car. So look back every now and then. But when you look back, look back at them good things, and then you can bring that into your present, and you can take control of the car again. You can start looking 100 feet in front of you. And, you know, even with the car analogy, you don't have to find the whole map. You don't need to look right in front of you, you know, 40 years in front of you or 10 years or whatever it is. You just need to see the next 100 feet. So I didn't love myself and I didn't accept what was going on that, yeah, in, a rap, in, in a rap at that point. Hey Gary, just to reflect back on when you were on this, this darker part of your life with drugs and alcohol, mm-hmm. were you trying to escape some emotion? Were you maybe angry at the world for taking it away from your... Were you angry at the world for... It taking your, your dad away were you just really sad what were you escaping that uh, drugs alcohol pro- provided and how did you i know you got past it because you actually saw saw a therapist so would you say the value that that you got from a therapist was just speaking about your emotions can you touch a little bit about that yeah it's really interesting as you're talking i'm asking myself what is it that i was avoiding or what was it that i really didn't want to feel and Really, I don't think I've ever been asked that question or even asked myself that question. What is it that I was trying to avoid? I felt like that there was like an empty emptiness in my heart. I felt like there was just something gone. I maybe think that was that void from my dad that maybe I got from him when he was here, but then, then it disappeared. So I maybe used drugs and alcohol and, and gaming to fill that void. What well, I swear where, you know, I don't know if he's there where. I won't ask you, but uh, drugs is a more of an instant thing. So that wasn't really good long term. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to fill that void. Yeah, definitely. Because I speak to a lot of patients, a lot of um, our patients that, that we see in a hospital, uh, some of them do use drugs. And I always talk to them like, hey, like what's causing this? And a lot of times they give me a very similar answer to yours that that they're trying to fill some kind of a void. It's like you're trying to fill a fill a glass that's always getting empty that you just you just cannot pour any more liquid into, but it's still always empty. It's a it's a weird thing thing because it's hard to understand if not if you don't go through it. It's hard to say that I'm trying to fill a void if you never had to fill a fill a void before. Man, and I were 
we're a little similar in, in a sense. I mean, we both still have their dads. We never lost our dads, but we had a Polish dad, so we were never really that close to our dads. So a lot of Polish people growing up, especially uh, people from Europe, uh, they usually have troubles maybe expressing emotions with their parents, especially with their father, because their father usually not there, they usually go to work. So a lot of times they also dabble into drugs and alcohol to fill that void of the emotional connection that they're missing from their fathers. Let, let me ask you this question. Have, have either of you ever suffered with depression? Um, I, would, I don't know about clinical depression, but there has been a part of my life where I was definitely struggling to to, to figure things out for sure. I, I would say, yeah, if I've ever felt depressed, I, I probably have from probably like a solid six months out of, out of my life where I was in a really dark place. Yeah, I, I don't think I ever labeled it as, you know, depression itself, but I think there was times of unhappiness, just like anybody are experiencing things or you might have like imposter syndrome or just doubts of not feeling self-love or even when I took my first travel nursing contract, there was like some bouts of loneliness that I experienced where all my friends were in a different state and I was just here working. Is this for me? Was this the right decision? And then you're getting into those mental spirals of overthinking because you're tripping in your own guilt in a way. Um, but b back to mental health, because I think that's a topic that every nurse needs to hear about more and more just, just because of how healthcare is. Based on your story and your experience, everything you went through in life, what are some tips and tricks that you love other people to know when it comes to mental health or some misconceptions that you heard that you want to speak to? Awesome. I think I've got two uh, right off the bat that comes to my mind. And one is I was in Dublin city center here where I live. I was speaking to random people. I brought in a notice board, a big massive whiteboard. And I said, Hey, um, I'll give you one euro for one minute. If you can answer one question. Uh, and the one question I asked, I asked uh, 10, 10 to 12 people the question. I asked, uh, what's we're going on depression? So what advice would you give to someone who's depressed? Hmm. I'd say about six or seven of the answers was talk, talk to someone. And I love it. And I like that. And let's say you're not depressed because to me, depressed is, you know, a two out of 10. Let's say suicide is one out of 10. And maybe we can touch on that scale. I love a scale of one to 10. We'll put that to the side for a second and go back to your point. You don't have to be completely depressed to talk. And the second one I want to mention, you know, the first one was that little one there with the, you know, talk to someone. You now I want to add on to that is please talk to a person who is competent in their role. Please talk to someone who is maybe in a position where, or a lifestyle that you want to live. You know, you're not going to go to the depressed person logically if you want to feel happy just doesn't make sense. So if you're going to go to a professional, please go to a professional that is competent in their role, who is maybe happy in their life, who've got good relationships, they're good with their finances, they, they feel amazing, and they're also happy about their own role. They're happy about their career, they're happy about their life. Yeah. So don't be afraid not to talk to someone and don't be afraid to go to someone else. So there's two points that just come up straight in my mind. Talk but also talk to people who will maybe inspire you or make you feel good. You know, they say you're the average of your five friends. So go to someone who's mm -hmm. a positive influence. I say that. So who was your positive influence in that case? So in my case, I would, and this is awesome. Thank you for asking that. So in my case, it would be, let's say my therapist really got me on the road to recovery. And then from that, it great thing is it doesn't have to be a person in person. It can be through audiobooks. It can be through videos on YouTube. It can be through reading. And this is really true. And this is genuinely 100%. If you have the podcast going on all day, every day, you're listening to it, you are going to pick up what their words are. You're going to know what their phrases are. You're going to speak like them. You're going to speak how intense they speak. If they speak slow, you're going to speak slow. Mm -hmm. And that's just because you're getting used to being in an environment with them. And maybe that's what happens to nurses or happens to any people in professions. They get used to an environment and then that just becomes the norm. Mm -hmm. So my influence is my, my role models was Tony Robbins, the number one success coach in the world. I mean, of course, why wouldn't he be my role model? You know? And I would have five people in personal development that I would listen to. Mm -hmm. And I, I probably wouldn't listen to them you know, an hour each day, but I'd listen to one of them at least an hour a day. So they were my role models at the start of people that are online, they don't have to be in person, although in person is awesome too. Mm. Yeah. What, what stood out to me, you said uh, a few minutes ago was 
you don't need to be depressed or I think you said suicide in order to talk to somebody. And I think that also reflects back to you don't need to be upset to go hug somebody. I think that's a misconception in our society too that we need to only hug somebody when they're crying, they're feeling bad. What if we could just give out hugs just because the sake of actually feeling abundance and love and being grateful and just changing that whole realm around? I think that'd be beautiful. Yeah, this is where I think we're flawed as 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 men is because we perceive ourselves as really masculine. We think that we can't talk about these things. We always have this ego on our back or on our shoulders. Every time we try to open up or talk to somebody, it's almost like we, f we feel less of, of a man. We feel weaker. I mean, that's not a good, good thought to have because it's not going to get you very far. Women, on the other hand, they're very lucky because they talk about anything and they could talk about anything, everything in, in the world. And they don't really go through this problem as much as guys because it's almost we almost destroy ourselves. Women, women destroy each other because they like to gossip, they like to talk. Men, we like to self, self destruct. We self destroy ourselves because we don't know and we're scared to let out what we have on the inside. So, was there any kind of moment maybe in your life, Gary, or maybe was it through a therapist where you finally realized, realized that, you're like, hey, I have to talk about this? And was there like a moment in your life that flipped that switch from being an introvert and quiet and not talking about your feelings to then opening up? Mm -hmm. yeah there definitely was that split second there was that moment where i said i freaking need help um for me you know like i had that moment and i went and got help for other people and maybe suicide people they and then they checked out unfortunately so you know an idea is a collection of thoughts so i was in my bedroom sitting here lying here and i was thinking wow i i don't have you know i don't feel i feel horrible okay i'm, I'm taking drugs all the time i'm I don't have my family. I don't even speak to my family. Okay. I'm ruining relationships. I hate work. I don't like myself. There was all these thoughts that came into a moment where it's just really, let's say it's, you know, you're carrying that big bag of weights around for some reason that I had that moment. I needed to go downstairs and I needed to talk to my mom. And I just said, mom, I need help. And that right there is, I don't know why we have a stigma, right? <laughs> why do we have a stigma? Because help, if you do ask for help, right, that means we can move forward. If you think about it, you know, we talk about Conor McGregor. We talk about superstars, Kevin Hart, Dwayne Johnson. It's not like Dwayne Johnson is on his own. It's like Dwayne Johnson has an agent, right? He has a personal trainer. He has a dietitian. He has a whole team around him that is supporting him. Yeah? So getting help, it's ridiculous that there is that stigma. And if we didn't, if we realized, which I think it, it's just a bit of a knowledge, more knowledge on the side of, okay, wow, help will actually move me forward. And it doesn't matter if you're one out of 10 suicidal or if you're an eight or nine out of 10, you can still get help to move up that scale. You can still get help anywhere. So come back, uh, I went off on a bit of a, a digress there for a moment, people. Yes, I had that moment where I needed help because I hate myself so much. So, so after you got help and maybe you kind of just built a new person up, right? What were your goals and dreams like? What were you passionate about during that next chapter that took place after you got help and sobered up and got this new spice of energy and lust for life? Beautiful. Definitely a new, a new lust for life is, is a great way to put it. And that's my nice friends. My goals and dreams, I didn't really have dreams back then, but I definitely had goals and they were small goals. Um, small relative to my goals, current goals. They were goals back then. And they were simply like prepare my meals, prepare my, not prepare my meals, but prepare for tomorrow. Or I, I remember vividly having 10,000 euro in, in, in an investing account. And eventually it got led to that. And then it was the last day it got to it and I achieved it. So I basically would flood my mind with motivation, hates. And just like we mentioned a moment ago, I did environment. You're going to pick up with everything else. You, you, you're listening to this for the first time. You're getting that rush. And I was excited for life. Well, I am excited for life right now. But back then, it was like that was giving me the lust to go on and change my life. And then maybe also for all of us here, we need to have reasons to why we do things. If we have enough reasons, we will do anything. If we have enough reasons to kill someone, we will do it. So. If we have enough reasons to make a change in our life, we will do it. I have enough reasons right now to achieve my dreams because if I know achieve my dreams, I'm going to impact my life, I'm going to impact my family's life, my friends, my colleagues, my 
at my network or anyone I network with in the future. I'm going to impact clients. I know I need to be at a high energy state. I need to be at a, um, at a positive state because that impacts everything around me. So I had more reasons back then to create that most followers. Yeah. Yeah. For, so it's like the first time you just flooded your mind with different thoughts that you were used to. Because you could 100% agree that once you start going down, down a dark path in life, your, your, mind, your mindset shifts to anger, frustration, and you just give yourself a lack of self-worth. And in your mind, all you hear is negativity, negativity, and you're just talking to yourself about you as a mm -hmm. negative person. And sometimes people go through this negative thought for years, for months, and they think that, that they're going to change in a week. It's, it's, not, it's not how it works. You've been thinking negatively about yourself for the last six months. It's going to take six months to flip that mindset. So it's very, very good that you were able to flood your mind with those things. Because before you could do anything, before you could change anything, you have to for sure, first, surely have to get your mind right. And you have to change those thoughts. And the only way to change those thoughts is maybe use an external source to input those, those thoughts in your mind. Like you mentioned um, Tony Robbins. Uh, when I was in a dark path in my life, I flooded my mind with Tony Robbins because he was just, he came from a, a difficult time, a dark path. So it's like almost you can relate to him. And it's a lot, a lot more beneficial and a lot easier for you to change your mindset if you also could maybe, like you, like you said, find like a mentor or somebody that's in a similar situation that also went through some kind of a trauma because then you can relate to, to, to him on some kind of level. And it shows you, it's almost like he's your friend at one point because he's telling you all this and you're relating, relating to him. So that's, a lot of, that's what people don't understand is you think about yourself negatively for six months, you're not going to be able to flip. In a, in a week it's going to take a lot it's gonna take lots and lots of work it could be meditation it could be yoga it could be just breath work but you have to put in the work and same thing goes to like um trying to change your, your body if you want to change your body say you want to work out gain some weight or, or gain muscle you understand you got to put the, the gym work in but first you also have to realize how important that gym work is through through your mind through your through your, through your thoughts so how long do you think it took you to finally maybe change your mindset? Just on your little analogy with the gym, is like when you go to the gym and you lift the weights the first day, don't expect the biceps to be, you know, bubbling the next day. So it's just exactly like that exercise in your body. It takes time to get that muscle to see the muscle to see results. It's going to take time for you to, to, uh, to change your mindset. I possibly wouldn't agree if you with your if you were six months feeling negative, then it would take six months to, to recover from that. I possibly wouldn't agree with that. But hey, that's just my belief. Mm. I believe you could recover in a quicker time, but maybe not a week. Uh, understand what you're saying. I don't. And uh, by the way, it's down to interpretation. Like there's no exact period. It's all it's all minds. It's all down to you. And there's no exact date. Can you remind me of what the question was for the second one. Uh, the question was was. For most part, how long was like your recovery process? How long did it take you to go through this beat up guy, depressed, drinking drugs to finally be able to, to pursue your dreams? Yeah. So I would say it would be a matter of two years mm. or a year and a half. And I was doing drugs and alcohol and kind of messing my life up for three years. Mm. So. so you did it for three years and it took you like two years to find a rebound off of it. Yeah. Yeah. See, like, I, I was, like, I mean, it's it's like a full rebound. Like, the other thing was in the in the two year period, you're still meditating, you're still growing. But like to say I'm completely freaking mm. on track with my goals and and life is amazing at that time. It was like a year, year and a half, two years. Yeah. Yeah. See, and the beauty of it is when you go through change, your brain becomes like a sponge. I noticed that a lot with with nursing students. So in nursing school, they go through this phase of studying, studying, studying. They're on this mission to get good grades. And then when they, so it's like basically nursing school was their baseline. So for example, your baseline was, you know, drugs and alcohol. I'm relating to nursing students. So nursing students, their baseline was nursing school. And then you went through this, through this giant change, took you two years. And going through this change, your body's kind of going through a crazy time where it's relearning things. It's unlearning things, relearning things. And it throws away negativity and it, and it holds on to this new information. And it's a change that I see nursing students go through once they leave school and they enter nursing. And their first two years of their career, they're just absorbing all this knowledge. Because before they were doing something different, they were in school, and now their life flipped. So now it's more of a different reality for them. And I feel like this, this 
this beginning portion of somebody changing, you just learn and, and absorb so much. And I'm sure, Matt, you could attest to that that as well. For example, when you start to leave nursing and start to do coaching, you probably grabbed on to a lot of this coaching stuff from your mentors. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very beautiful. So it's like a crazy, crazy event that takes place in our lives where we're able to literally change. And, that, and we change because we put our body selves in this almost like this fight and flight situation on, on, a, on purpose. And you just, you just keep learning, keep learning, keep learning. And that's why people are able to change and then stay this positive for such a long time. Because you hear people relapsing, going back to back to their drugs, back to their alcohol. You know, hopefully it doesn't happen to you. I wish you, wish you the best. But sometimes people don't take advantage of that first couple of years of that really, really growth and really, really learning. I was going to say, other than like therapy for your success, what else have you used as far as mental health tools that progressed you on your way? Was it maybe journaling? I know you mentioned something about meditation. Were there any, any other tools in your success? Yeah, journaling was definitely one of the biggest things. I still have a journal I had back back then, that, that, that rough year that I really started making a change. That journal was changed my life dramatically. That was one of the best things, tracking my day, what was what I was going to do in the day, and what I had in the past week, what was on my mind, or what was bogging me down, what I'm feeling this way. So the journal was one of the best things that I've done. I don't do it right now because it had its time and its place. It served me. It's not serving me anymore. I do other things now. Meditating was something I'd done. I'd got up early before I'd go to work at 4 or 5 a.m. and I'd, I'd exercise. So it's them really three things, meditating, journaling, and uh, exercising really worked for me. But I absolutely 100% know for everyone it's individual and it's not. Them three things are going to work for you 100% of the time. You might like, I know, breath work, like Pete, uh, Pete mentioned, or you, like, you might like walking instead of you know taking a long run. So it's all individualized on their recovery process steps. Find out what works for you. And if it works for you, keep doing it. I often say this thing. I think Jordan Peterson says as well. It's do the things you know you should do. And if you did do them, that would improve your life. You know eating healthy. But you just know that is something you should do. You know exercising you should, you should do. Or you know maybe reading a book. Or maybe not watching TV for so long, staying on social media, or not drinking alcohol so much, or doing drugs. You know intuitively them things are not good. So if you just listen to that intuition inside of you, you will make progress towards your goals, towards your dreams, unconsciously. So yeah, them three things that I mentioned there a moment ago. They were the two biggest keys to my success. I love the fact that you brought up Jordan Pearson, Gary, because Jordan Pearson and I go way back. I read one of his 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 books, uh, first books. And what really changed my life is the point that he mentions, and it's a metaphor, uh, to clean your room. Because mm -hmm. if, you, if you have a messy room, how can you have a, a clean home, for example? And you could, the messy room is your mind and a clean home is the, is the world, right? So how can you have a good, clean world and go through, through life if you, your, if you yourself aren't clean or your room is, isn't clean? So it was a crazy thing because I cleaned my room, like physically, and then... After that, I was in it, it is dark part of my life. I clean, I clean my room, and after I clean my room, it's almost like my thoughts cleared out. And then I apologize to my family members where you know I, I did the, I wasn't the best person, so I apologize. You know, I forgave my my father at, at that point when I when I was younger for all the shit that happened with with us and everything. So that was that was very very calming, a very um, it was a very good feeling. So how did how did you clean your room? What was the clean that that you had to do? I I. I don't know exactly well how to answer that, but I know for sure that I would have heard that from Jordan Peterson. Mm. You know, I also know your messy desk, messy mind, so clean your room. Mm. That is such a humbling process. And I often hear, um, I don't know, from the, from the Navy SEAL, maybe you've seen the tape, it's like, make your bed. Mm. It's the first thing you do at home. And it's so humbling, it's so simple. Mm. That it really is that simple thing that, that can help drastically. Right, yeah. And mm. then you mentioned, um, you also mentioned before about like the chaoses of life and Jordan Peterson does talk a lot about chaos and order and what's wonderful about that is is we all go through chaos and order some people have different chaos different order for example your chaos was mm -hmm. drugs alcohol hitting the bottom low was your chaos and through chaos comes order and through order then comes chaos so when you were younger when you had your dad you probably had some order and then it threw yourself into chaos and you had to get out of that chaos yep it's a it's a it's a circle right so and that's a beautiful thing is that that chaos order, that's for everyone. It's not, 
someone's chaos isn't bigger than anyone else's chaos. So just because you go through your chaos of drugs and alcohol, losing your dad, someone's chaos might be losing their home, and that's all they need. Some, some, some maybe their chaos might be leaving college. Like it could be, you could it could be small, but to them it's very subjective. It could be very big. So we all go through this phase of chaos and order, and every time we go through these these bad things, we come out on a positive. If you could, if you could kind of catch up with that with that chaos. So, did you learn anything else from Jordan Peterson? Um, uh, just thinking lobsters are coming to my mind, first of all. And hierarchies. Um, that's coming to my mind. And you want to elaborate on anything like that? A hierarchy? I, yeah. So with the whole, or anything important in general, I think we could all benefit from, uh, from knowledge from Jordan. So, this is another thing. When you were coming out of the slump did your physical appearance change did you start walking maybe giving more eye contact walking up with your you know chest up more because every time someone brings up hierarchy i always think think of lobsters and uh, lobsters uh they do get into fights a lot but a lot of times they don't get physical and they usually none of, none of them really die but what they do is they give out these physical traits where you know one just poses bigger and the other one kind of gets scared off so that kind of relates to you physically showing the world that you're capable of doing things. So has your physical demeanor changed during that time or maybe have you noticed? 100%, that's beautiful. If we go back like five minutes ago, we were talking about how simple, you know, making your bed or cleaning your room is. That's just a, just a simple thing. But with your physiology, that is also a simple thing to do. You're looking at people in their eyes, you're standing with your shoulders back. That is such a simple thing to do. And that has a drastic effect over the course of your life. Mm. You know, we all know what a depressed person is like. Their shoulders slumped, their head down, they're, they're not looking at you. They got they're speaking on a low tone. And that, that goes across the board. Mm. If you want to be confident, you got to sit like a confident person. You got to act like a confident person. Just like the lobsters are acting tougher, big and tougher, but stronger than the other people, the other lobsters, they, they gain them. And another small thing as well, just being grateful for waking up. Mm. Small, small things add up to massive, massive things. Mm. So it's, it's good that you're, that you're emphasizing these beautiful points, Pete, because you know, small things matter. Use your physiology to your, to your advantage. And I like how you said small things because that's exactly what habits are, right? Like creating routines in your daily life to keep habit stacking to create this new identity or this new person that you're trying to embody. And that's the way to kind of eliminate the gap because a lot of times you, we have this goal and dream but the goals and dreams are still a gap between where you are and where you want to be. And the whole point is to just give yourself that the daily habits to bridge that gap. So through your journey, have you had some non-negotiable habits that you're always sticking with? I know you mentioned maybe you don't journal anymore. And that's that's awesome, too, because as your consciousness evolves as a human, you tend to switch things that work out for you and don't. And all these little tools like meditating, breath work, journaling, those are just all tools mm -hmm. of consciousness. There's no right or wrong things to do them. Some people maybe like plant medicine and go that route. There's no bad answer to that. But throughout this time, have any habits stuck with you where you love to practice them? Maybe it's a morning routine or an evening or nighttime ritual that you have with yourself. Yeah, both of them, morning and evening. And then you delve into them things. I think they've become more of my standard nowadays. Maybe they were non negotiables at the start and I said, hey, this is what I'm going to do and regardless of what happens. But now they're like, this is who I am. An example would be an exercise and then eating healthy. And nowadays I, I make sure I run one lap around my block here six days a week. That's just a non negotiable habit myself. So exercise still stuck with me. Eating healthy is still stuck with me. What about you, Matt? Have you got any non negotiables that you stick with on a day to day basis? Yeah, great question. So I still love the habit of journaling. I don't think it's a daily thing, but it's a few times a a week. And the reason why I like doing it, I like to reflect. It does a journal doesn't always have to be when I'm going through something bad. Maybe it's a reminder for myself. So let's just say I want to practice gratitude. Sometimes it's really hard to get into that energetic state where you're actually abundant and grateful. There's a difference between wanting to do it and and thinking affirmations of abundance, but then actually embodying it and feeling it energetically. So sometimes picking up the pen and writing physical words of appreciation to myself or 
you know, I, I always was over critical of myself, right? So for me, my, my main thing is not being critical acceptance of, hey, this was a great productive day. So I could not beat myself up and I could be grateful and pursue. So gratitude, journaling, uh, I do try to meditate at least daily. If it's not maybe like this 20, 50 meditation, at least to start my day and get into the state of abundance, right? Telling myself today's gonna be a great day. Or in this case, because I like to be overcritical of myself, I like to wake up and say, no matter what I do today, it's going to be a productive day because I'm going to put 100% effort. And then when I go to sleep, I tell myself the same thing. So no matter how my day was, my rational mind, which was operating from old beliefs, doesn't snoop in there and tell myself, you should have done more. Today wasn't a good day because I'm, I'm trying to get into that state of abundance all the time. Uh, long answer to a short story. So yeah, definitely meditating and, and journaling are my non-negotiables. You know, there's some other ones like I like to train three times a week. And, but yeah, definitely diet and exercise just to get the body right so you could actually get into the higher. It's like hierarchy, just like you guys said. We need that foundation of feeling safe, the foundation of feeling good with your body. Then you could get to the mind and then you could self-actualize and, and, you know, pursue goals and dreams. It's awesome. As, a, as you're speaking, I want to ask Pete as well the same question. One another simple thing, um, I'm liking the way I'm emphasizing these simple things, is that not checking your phone, that for me is worked wonders. Not checking my phone first thing in the, in the morning, pulling down the other side of the room or, or just whatever. Because when you see a text message, the text message could be negative. Then you're in, then you just set up your tone for the next four hours. Or you have a, a, a bad email, whatever it is. So the first hour of the day, first 40 minutes, whatever, no phone. Um, people, what about you? Have you got any non-negotiables over, over the course of your past couple of years? Non-negotiable. So, uh, very similar uh, to your situation when you were younger too. Was I used to meditate and journal a lot when I was younger, and I kind of stemmed through that. I like I'm pretty simple. So, I, I wake up, I, I wake up wired. Like I wake up ready to go, flooded with ideas. So I need something to get the energy out. Because if I'm not doing something physical, or if I'm not working something, then um, I get too much of my thoughts. And my thoughts usually go into, uh, like, kind of, you could say, the negatives. Not that I'm a negative person, but I think there's so much thoughts that go through my, through my mind if I'm not doing something and focus on something if, where I just get flooded. So the gym, for sure. Uh, I'm a big person on a David Goggins, David Goggins approach where it's like if you want to be hard and stay hard, you got to do some, something hard. And that approach where we're, we're guys, so we have to let out this external energy. Because if you don't let, let this external energy out, it's going to stay with us and you're going to do stupid things with it. Stupid things as in get in trouble when I was younger or stupid things as in stupid thoughts now that, I, that I'm older because I'm smart enough not to get into trouble, you know. So just non-negotiable is working out. I work out every day if that's either martial arts or the gym, uh, something physical. I, I need to get that out because if I don't get that out, I feel like a piece of shit, basically. I, I, don't, I don't know why, but it's, it's, it has, I have to get that out of my system non-negotiable the gym and that's really all i need uh if i have some extra time i do some meditation uh i, I read non-negotiable is also read even though i don't read every day i try to read at least three to four times a week uh, just because i don't have always time for it as much as i you know, i don't feel like it and if i don't feel like reading then i just don't read i don't want to force myself to read because that that's like you're in school you're forced to do something so i don't want to be forced to do something that, that i that i enjoy because you don't always in, enjoy everything for example like dessert like you, you love ice cream, but sometimes you just don't want to eat ice cream, right? So you just, just don't eat it. So I'm a big point of that, that even though you love something, doesn't mean you have to do it every day. You could kind of just skip it a day or two. It's not, not a big deal. But like I said, at the beginning, non-negotiable. I'm a simple guy at the gym. I have to burn that out. And then also chase my thoughts because I already feel the gym to me is the hardest thing I do all day. The hardest thing. Because that way, when I get done with the gym, I already know I did the hardest thing I did today rest is smooth sailing. the rest is easy no complaints i have no reason to complain about anything because the hardest thing i i recompleted and, I, and i'm done with so yeah the gym on the gym the hardest that being the hardest thing i like the gym particularly for that is a place you can practice hard work that is a place mm. you can go there and that is a beautiful place to grow your hard work ability and hard work is all different to each other yep. you know we asked lebron james is working hard it, of course he's going to be working hard our standard is different but that's a nice place for you to go in your own zone mm. and work 100%. It's very humbling. Yeah. 
like everything's the people that are humbling because no matter what there's somebody stronger than you there's somebody bigger than you uh the weights themselves are humbling because yeah you can lift 70 pound dumbbell but you can't get the 81 so even these non-physical th non-physical things are humbling and it's almost like a stepping stone to life just so just because i can get the 80 up this week or this month I got the 80 up next month. And it's almost like a g metaphoric journey through life where I'm increasing the weight. My leg kicks are get getting better. My head kicks are getting better. And it's almost like you're improving your physicality and it's some somehow your life is also improving at the, at the same time out of the gym. It's like a very, very, um, like a tiratara effect. You, you improve one, other one follows suit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a metaphor there, Pete. Have you got any metaphors for life? Have you got any favorite metaphors? I'm a big fan of metaphors. Uh, metaphors. Like I gave you one earlier with the, hmm. with, the, with the driving and the car. You can't you can't drive your car looking in the rear view mirror. Hmm. Like you've got to crash your car. That's the bottom line. So you can look back and you can use that for life. You can look back and reminisce in some good times. You don't want to get stuck looking in your rear view mirror and crash. Hmm. So that, I love metaphors. Have you got any metaphors that you like? Uh, but so I actually did throw. It's hard for me to think about on the spot. But yesterday, yeah. I, I was talking to my, my buddy and we were talking about um truths and, and lies so a good metaphor for for honesty is like structure so for example if you build a building and you half-ass the, the calculations and you, you we can build a building it's gonna fall because you, you were just off by 0.1 of a millimeter or one centimeter just because you got lazy same 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 with a lie a lie is basically you're getting lazy because you don't want to tell the truth and what eventually happens is that lie falls apart so that building falls apart because you half-assed it yeah, I think that's something that stands out for me. And I have like a journal that I write down powerful words that I could just repeat or think about. So my metaphor would be that your life is an expression of joy, not the pursuit of happiness. And the goal is to feel blissed by our own nature. And it kind of reflects back to the internal work where we always want to look at materialism from the physical realm and attach when we have that and achieve that, I'll be happy. But it's always creating the, that gap because the next thing you get, you're going to find something else that you're going to yearn for. And it's going to always create that gap of unhappiness. So the ultimate goal here is to look within and see what you can get from yourself. You know, it's, it's just like um, like your partner. What do you want from your partner that maybe you are looking for? What can you get from yourself that maybe you're looking for in another partner? Because a lot of times we're we're yearning for something that we could, that we're really not giving ourselves. Great example is, for example, like self love, right? Or we have an anxious attachment style, so we develop like jealousy or something, and we want that partner to to feel whole. When really we just need to learn how to maybe not feel anxious that we're going to be left alone or change those beliefs. So, yeah, I'm very big on looking very introspective to change a lot of the, the external viewpoints and perspectives because you technically can't change your reality but you can change your perspective of how you view rea view reality based on your perception and then reality technically changes yeah what when Doyle has the quote you know what you what you look at or how you look at things or some along the lines i don't even know that quote what you went there is the way you look at things or how you view things the way you look at things, a change different. I don't know. Wayne Dyer, search it up. Perception, you, you you can get it there. Yeah, how you look at things looks different or something like that, along them lines. So yeah. What What about you? Do you have something that resonates with you? So in terms of metaphors, I love metaphors. I'm a big believer in metaphors. I think they're great to describe and, and give to people to to make break down thing break down you know complex things into simple things. You know, I often say. Here's a beautiful one that I like to use. It's like Ireland, known for its cloudy weather here. And it could be dark and miserable in winter. But even that it is dark and miserable in the clouds, you've got to realize that behind them clouds is a lovely blue sky. And like Jordan Peterson, Pete, a clean room, clean mind. I associate a blue sky with a clear mind. So yes, the clouds are there and you can focus on the clouds but you can focus on the blue sky that's right behind it. You can visualize the blue sky. Again, the mind can't tell the difference between reality and imagination. So just see the blue sky. And that's that's down to you. You can choose what you view. Another metaphor that I love is the, is the, you know, the drop, the water droplet into a pond, into a pool, that it just ripples down and affects everything. 
goes across the whole pond. And you and me, the listeners, are the job group. I completely, Jordan Peterson, take responsibility. You are in control of your life. It's your decisions today that are going to dictate what you're going to eat, how you're going to exercise, who you're going to talk with, what you're going to do in your life. It's literally going to be down to you. Now, that is not something that should be taken scarcely or feeling anxious about that. That should be an empowering thing. You are in control of your life. You are a droplet in the ocean. So how you interact with people is going to have an effect on that person. How you talk is going to have an effect on other people. How you use your physiology is going to have an impact on other people. And we know that. There's a transmutation of energy that goes out to other people. I am such a big, massive believer in responsibility and your life that it's not just you. It is not just you. Although you do have to work on yourself. Another metaphor comes to mind is, you know, who do you put the mask on first in the plane? You put on your brother, you put on a mask, you put on Pete, you put on your, your sister. No, you put on yourself first. There's a bit more responsibility for you. A lot of people don't like taking that, I don't think. But going back into this droplet point, I really want to emphasize this to, to everyone because I think it's massively important that you are a node and you're on a podcast right now, used to guys, and you're sharing this episode. And if we say a joke, or we make this an interesting podcast, or make this energetic, the listener is going to go, and they're feeling energized, they're feeling upbeat. Again, if you listen to sad songs, we're going to feel sad. If you listen to sad stories, you're going to feel sad. If you listen to happy songs, you're going to feel happy, you're going to feel happy with happy stories. So if we give good content in just one example of a podcast, that means the listener is going to go home, they're going to be in a positive state, so that is going to have a positive effect on their family, but maybe they're going to work. Right? So then they have a positive effect on their colleagues in the work, so when they're feeling good, are they more likely to get good things happening to them? And they're more likely to get a raise if they're feeling good or if they're feeling negative? And they're more likely to get feeling a raise if they're feeling positive. So if you want to take that outside of a podcast, if you eat crap food, how are you going to feel? Right? To me, I know I feel crap when I have crap food. And so I feel bloated. I feel, you know, well, ugh, I don't want to do anything. Now, is that the best me? Is that the best me I want to show up my relationship? Do I want to go downstairs, see my family, and I, do I want to be like, uh, do I want to come on a podcast? Uh, uh, no. I want to be that, that empowering droplet that has a ripple effect to a whole community of people. And you could literally go into your family. Okay, who's going to be affected by me achieving my dreams? Myself, my mom, my sister, my my sister's baby, my sister's boyfriend, my friends. You've got to realize that you are a massive node. Okay, even if you don't get on a podcast, you interact with someone in the shop, make the person in the shop feel good because when they feel good, another customer is going to come in and that customer might feel good and then the customer goes home. You've got to realize that you are a massive, massive individual in this world and you can make a massive difference. You're listening, you're talking, whatever it is, that one drop of it literally goes the whole way across they say smile is contagious smart uh, laughing is contagious right so let's get the whole freaking world infected on smiles and, and laughs okay guys we don't want any more covid we want we want to infect the world on smiles i want to i want to hit you with a, with a question um first of all are you religious yeah. i am um, i i i am open I, if that makes sense okay. I, i'm not particularly on one religion have you ever heard of uh, the saying or the phrase existence is suffering or life is suffering? Yeah. What do you think about that that phrase? I mean, it's 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 interesting. I I haven't thought about it much. So all these thought, all these words I'm gonna put out where are not a fully formed thought or an idea. Mm. But what do I think on that point is that yeah, there's, there's times life is suffering, but there's also times life is bliss. Mm. And I, I went into town today, I took massive action. I was feeling anxious, feeling, you know, fearful going in, but I still did it. And even when I come home, I'm still going, was that good enough action? Was Did I do good enough today? You know, so it's still suffering in regards of no matter basically whatever action I've done. So life could be suffering, but I, I don't want to live from that paradigm. I don't want to live from that belief because there is definitely times of bliss, definitely times of life is freaking amazing and in this moment you can choose what you put your focus on and where your focus goes energy flows you can focus on the blue sky you can focus on the roses you can focus on the nice smell there the bakery from you down the road you can focus on them beautiful things or you can focus on the suffering things like my thoughts of 
what did I do good enough? Um, I could get caught up in that, or I can go get caught up in the bakery to the tail on the road. Mm-hmm. So, what do you, have you had a fully formed thought on that? He, yeah, I suffer? definitely. So I used to be big into Buddhism uh, when I was yeah. in my early twenties. I did a lot of a lot of reading about Zen Buddhism, uh, the different studies of, of the Buddha and uh, Western religions, and existence is suffering. That's probably my favorite phrase. A lot of people tell me uh, the same thing you said that my life. Is, is blissful, it's not just suffering. But the beauty of, of that is you wouldn't be able to love that clear sky or resonate with uh, with a clear mind or those things if you didn't have that suffering that, that comes with yeah. it. Because if you have suffering, if you have pain, then you have to have the other, other one. It's almost like you can't have good days without bad days. So the suffering and the crazy about suffering is we, a lot of times you get the most joy out of suffering. For example, it could be a small thing, like dropping your friend off to, to work. You can maybe hate doing it, but you get joy from it in, in, in a sense. So that's the beauty of it where life is suffering because without, without the suffering, you can't appreciate what you have and you can't, you can't appreciate life and you won't and you can't have love and you can't have happiness without the suffering. Because we're losing what makes us the happiest is where we're making other people, people happy. And a lot of times, making other people happy, it's a self-sacrifice. And that self-sacrifice is, is hard to do and it sucks. But the result of it is is long lasting happiness. So yeah, I just threw that one at you. I I that's my favorite f- saying that has like stayed with me for such a long time, especially when I was going through like some of the hard parts of life. But I just got hooked onto the life is suffering, and you gotta embrace that that suffering. For like exa- like just to throw in the gym sense, because I think you could throw a lot of things into the gym. Physically, the gym sucks. It's hard to do. It's hard to lift those weights. You're sore, but then afterwards you feel so great and you and you you you, you feel so good. So that always resonates with me. Every time people ask me, like, what's your favorite quote? What's your favorite this? What's your favorite that? Life is suffering is, is my number one go-to. So, Matt, what is, I don't think I asked you that for a while. Matt, what is your thoughts on, on that? Existence is suffering. Yeah, I'm glad you asked. So kind of going back to what Gary said where he overcame resistance, anxiety. He recorded something. But back home, he got into, like, a mental loop and thinking, was this good enough? Was that, right? So technically, that are st- those are small bits of suffering but technically he's only suffering because he has a belief that maybe it wasn't good enough. But back to the fundamental truth here, if we change the belief and focus on the right data where energy flows, so if your attention is that it was good, you won't be suffering in that given moment, right? But if your attention is what ifs, how, how did I perform? You're judging yourself. You're creating self-consciousness, not self-awareness. You're creating loops of suffering. So I think just like you said, life is suffering. It's also full of overcoming suffering. I think the closer we could bridge the gap between our maybe soul mission in life, what we're actually tended to do here and overcoming the rational mind of our body's intelligence because it's programmed on the subconscious of what the past was, the closer we could align there, the less suffering we'll have. So I think that just like the ocean has, you know, waves of emotion, there's waves of suffering, but there's also overcoming that. And I think life doesn't have to be all just suffering. We just have to learn how to bridge that gap and align ourselves. Because if you have a purpose, for example, me, I wanted to do a podcast, be a coach. But if I kept having self-limiting beliefs of I'm not good enough for this role, I'm not competent enough, I'm suffering because of my own thoughts. Life is not technically suffering there. I'm suffering because of my self-limiting beliefs. So the more we could realize where we're looping in guilt and bad emotions, that's not the point. The bo- like the point of guilt is not to loop in it. The point of guilt is to recognize what that trigger is, why I'm being triggered based on my external environment, and then what what can I reframe, like you said, pour your attention differently to stop that suffering. So I do agree that life is suffering, but there's also a lot of overcoming of it if you have the right mindset, if you're looking at the situation right, and then realizing where you're struggling based on your self-limiting beliefs that are creating extra suffering that doesn't have to be there. It's almost like the Band-Aid effect, right? Um, Back to, um, like you said, energy, right? You have to 
you have to go work out to get rid of all this energy. But why is this energy accumulating to such a point where it's creating suffering in a sense? Why, why can't we embody that energy, feel it for what it's saying? And how can we channel it down to, for example, the root chakra and be grounded in that energy just so it doesn't stimulate the mind so much, just so it's not creating overthinking, just so it's not creating self-limiting beliefs where it's causing suffering. So, yeah, that's my long story on it. I think that life is suffering, but also we just have to learn where we're giving away our own power to the victimhood of self-limiting beliefs, past, and et cetera. Yeah, it's very well said. Because just to give you a little, a little backstory is, so the, the belief of Buddhism is there's no, nothing is good or bad. So a lot of times people hear suffering, they think of it as a bad thing. But with, with Eastern philosophies and, and Buddhism, you, do, you don't have good and bad. So suffering is not, it's, it's not necessarily you, you struggling. It's just you going through life. So it's almost like saying existence is, is, is life. You can, you're, you're, on, you're, you're on the right page. I did a lot of exploration, not to get too philosophical, but I did a lot of exploration with this meaning because suffering is, it sounds so, so bad. Like, oh, you got to do hard stuff. You got to go through trauma. But that's not necessarily what, what suffering is. Suffering is just basically an explanation of, explanation of life. Existence is, just, existence is you going through life. And like, like you said, a beautiful thing is, is recognition, is you recognizing things. You recognize negative things or these good things and just accepting them for, for what they are. Because just because something hurts, something is hard, doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's bad. Doesn't mean necessarily it, it is it's suffering in a sense. It's just life. So I'm glad you brought that point up. That's why I asked you, man, because you, you what you do so well is you're able to realize these, these things and and just like let things go and you say it very nicely. So suffering so existence is suffering doesn't actually mean that life is shit, life is hard, life is negative. It just it just means existence is, is life. And you should go through through life just as you are. Just, just as if like to me, what I hear, flow. what I hear the word suffering, I probably, probably a lot, a lot of people who hear the word suffering, that is like a red word. That is a word that's like, this sucks. So, yeah, the way it's phrased, life is suffering. But now you put that context, it's like, yeah, it, it just is. And um, you think if you think of like a depressed person, like what words are they using? Are they using happy, amazing, joyful, the roses, the beautiful smells? No, they're they're talking about pessimism. They're using them words. And we have emotions to them words. Right? We suffering to probably ninety percent of people listening, or maybe even more, would have been a negative word. They probably would have went into a negative state. So the words we use is actually pretty incredibly, incredibly important. And if you don't have the context to them words, I could have just went off this podcast and just said, okay, suffering, like a suffering. Oh, gee, they would have been on my own train of thought with that. So it, that's also a hack in my eyes. You know, air quotes to to feel them really, really amazing. Is to use amazing words because they have them emotions attached to them. Yeah. You can use them powerful words, and we will feel empowered. Yeah, very, very powerful. They mention that because language is everything, right? So I had somebody where I asked them, "Hey, let's journal about ten things that you did positive for someone or that you realized," and that person wasn't able to find those ten things. So that just means that their lens, their perspective of how they're viewing yeah. life, their language isn't there we have to change the language the words that they're using or they're interacting with this outside reality so they could see positivity because it's there technically like you said there isn't no no good nor bad they're just there's no focus on it their attention is just completely somewhere else were they able yeah. to compose a list of bad things sorry go ahead gary no no you can go ahead awesome. uh, so matt were they able to compose a list of 10 negative things they did to somebody or no or is that not part of the question that was in the part okay, of the question. Okay. I was only focusing on the, the positivity. Mm. Uh, Gary, last question that we'd like to ask all of our guests. If you had the opportunity to have a cup of coffee with anybody one last time, who would it be and why? i got to go with Tony Robbins. Uh, I'm going to have two, maybe two questions. One of them is like a jokey question. It's like He's all about being in a peak state. So I've got to ask him, does he ever listen to sad songs? Or does he ever do sad movies? Like, does he ever, or does he just really train his mind to always be in the happy peak state? Because he probably knows that being in the happy peak state has such an impact on people's life. Actually, I think, let's just go with that as my quest. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd, I'd sit down with Tony Robbins because he is the number one success coach in the world and he's impacted millions and millions of lives in a positive way. So why wouldn't I?
Uh, the, have you ever been asked that question, Mike? Uh, I don't think we have, Matt, have we? No one has asked. No, yeah, yeah. Well, let's walk on, dudes. Let's do it. So, Matt. So, I would, I would, it would be Mahatma Gandhi. I've wrote a paper about him in high school. I was very inspired on how he brought together the community of Indians to overcome the British that were kind of like, uh, they're creating co colonies in India and the whole salt, salt march thing. So I'm very inspired. And here on the Cup of Nurses, we want to create a mission to change nursing. So the big thing with nursing is how do we bring the community together to create this impactful change? Because healthcare has a lot of flaws. Every single shift I work, I see more flaws. So how can we create that change? And the cr change is starting with the community and bring them together. So I would love to sit down with a cup of coffee and just pick his mind, his wisdom on how he brought people together. What, what was his energy like? How was he feeling? His gestures, his emotions. I just want to absorb all that like a like a psychic sponge. <laughs> I, I kind of read a bit of Mahatma Gandhi's book and the one thing I take from it is just that he wanted to live in truth. So that's actually what I tried to do, live in truth. Um, I don't want this podcast to end, but Pete, if you got to answer that question of the coffee and you sure. Mine changes based on where I'm, where I'm at in life and just what I'm thinking about. But yeah. uh, I would say right now, Jordan Peterson, because he's been through a crazy life. So you know how we talked about chaos and order before? So I'm not, I'm not sure how closely you follow Jordan Peterson, but he's a psychologist for everybody that, that doesn't know that's listening. And he's a, he's a very good psychologist from, from Canada. And the crazy thing is he talks about chaos and order, right? And that's like a giant metaphor to to his life because he's a psychologist, but yet he was addicted to benzos and he overdosed on benzos and had a was in a coma for the withdrawals and now he's back doing doing his thing. So it's like a crazy thing how somebody like that, just as smart as him, can fall fall to those kind of situations where you would think like, hey, how can this psychologist be addicted to to these to these drugs that he's prescribing? And yeah, almost died from him. So it's almost like all the stuff that he talks about, it's literally like he's almost talking about himself, which is which is a crazy thing. So I wouldn't, I, I want to pick his brain and what he thinks about that, and kind of walk me through how all that happened. I know he had a lot of stuff going with his wife; she had a cancer, all that kind of stuff. So I know how he fell into that trap. But I just, I just want to ask him, like, how how does it feel to be a literally a reflection of the things that you teach? That's what I would ask him for now. And then next week's probably something different, but for this week, it's this. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm sure I'll have a different answer in a couple, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Too. Yeah, yeah. And maybe I find myself with Tony Robbins because I spoke about him earlier. Mm -hmm. well, hey, it's all good. Yeah, Tony Robbins is great. Like I know when I was going through some shit back in the day, Tony Robbins was, was I would want to talk to him. I was going mm -hmm. to one of his uh, shows in Chicago that I wasn't able to attend because it just got bought out so quick. But Tony Robbins definitely, definitely was my first person that really made me want to uh, live a good, a good life and really showed me that there's a light at the end of that tunnel and realize that, hey, I'm not this person that, that, that I think I am. I'm more to this negative, I'm more than these negative thoughts. Very powerful guy. Yeah, I don't listen to him as much anymore because like you said, there's a time and a place for, for everything, but give him credit to the person I am today, 100% <laughs> is, is devoted all to him. Yeah, he's awesome. Gary, where can people find you? You can find me, I'm just searching Gary Clinton on, on Instagram. I'm, I'm not the best at this, but Hey, I'm gonna still be around. I'm gonna be still kicking. I'm still gonna be growing. So I appreciate you, you two guys for sure. Thanks so much, Gary. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate appreciate the listeners too. Yep. Thanks, Gary. Mm -hmm.